Our reading this morning is going to be in Exodus chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. Exodus chapter 2, 1 through 10. And there went a man of the house of Levi, and took to wife a daughter of Levi. And the woman conceived, and bare a son. And when she saw him that he was a goodly child, she hid him three months. And when she could no longer hide him, she took for him an ark of bulrushes, and daubed it with slime and with pitch, and put the child therein. And she laid it in the flags by the river's brink. And his sister stood afar off to wit what would be done to him. And the daughter of Pharaoh came down to wash herself at the river. And her maidens walked along by the river's side. And when she saw the ark among the flags, she sent her maid to fetch it. And when she had opened it, she saw the child. And behold, the babe wept. And she had compassion on him and said, This is one of the Hebrews' children. Then said his sister to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call to thee a nurse of the Hebrew woman, that she may nurse the child for thee? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. And the maid went and called the, mother's, the child's mother. And the, father's, the Pharaoh's daughter said unto her, Take the child away and nurse it for me, and I will give thee thy wages. And the woman took the child and nursed it, and the child grew. And she brought him unto Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. And she called his name Moses, and she said, Because I drew him out of the water. Amen. Additional reading this morning is also going to be found in Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11, this text of scripture here will give to us a commentary, another angle, if you will, uh, on the life of Moses as we make this the... Uh, theme of the servant here this morning. So you, if you will, go to Hebrews chapter 11. We'll pick up a reading of verse 23. And here we find that by faith Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because they saw he was a proper child and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. By faith, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured seeing him who is invisible. Another text of scripture, if you'll just turn to it, because you're going to find, we're going to go to it later on, is in Acts chapter 7. We'll read it, and uh, then we'll move back over to Exodus. Acts chapter 7, if you turn there, and we want to begin our reading in this chapter of that at verse 20. Here we have Stephen given his final sermon as a deacon, and uh, it would lead, eventually lead to his execution. But I'll, we're interested in, not so much his execution, but as he's giving a review of Israel's history, he informs us of Moses, at which time Moses was born and was exceeding fair and nourished up in his father's house three months. And when he was cast out, Pharaoh's daughter took him up and nourished him as her own son. And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptian and was mighty and in word and deed. And when he was full 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. So we'll stop there. Let's begin our uh, time now with a word of prayer. And Father, we wanna thank you that we have this narrative, this story, this very accurate record of Moses but it's not so much the Moses that we are interested in as it is his parents, the ones that would risk their lives because they had a profound, explicit faith in the living God, and so much more as the word will reveal to us here today. So we ask, Lord, that at this very special occasion, the dedication of a child by parents, Mark and Jen, that they would be able to see from the life of Moses' parents what all is involved in when it comes to uh, lending your child to the Lord and committing him to your care and for your purpose and for your use. 
We thank you, Lord, that we could be challenged by these things. We know that we need not worry about doing it on our own strength, but by your grace, which will be uh, far more sufficient than what we need. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name, amen. Well, this is one of those sermons, there are two things that I have to take into consideration. Number one, James. He's probably blowing me a kiss. Keep it simple, silly, silly because James is not interested in 40 to 45 minutes. He wants something that's gonna wind it down inside of about 30 minutes because he's typically not used to sitting there listening to the preacher ramble one. But at the same time, to be able to speak to all of us as congregation, because when we talk about a baby dedication, it's not just to the parents, all of us. All of us are involved when, in, in the help, in the nurturing, in the admonition, the upbringing, the strengthening, the building of faith into our next generation. So we have that also to take into consideration. We use the language of being set apart for God, because essentially that's what a baby dedication is all about. It's when parents uh, in their own hearts, God moved upon them to be able to lend that child, commit that child, surrender him over to the Lord. And there are some words that surround this whole idea of what it is for a baby dedication. For that matter, this is the language that applies to any time to any person when they dedicate their life to the Lord. When we uh, dedicated this building to the Lord, when Nehemiah dedicated the new built temple to the Lord. There's language in there that, that surrounds it. There are words that we have to be aware of to help us see the fullness of what it means in this act of dedication. One of them would be a surrender. We, we relinquish the right to own and to keep for ourselves for our own purposes. We surrender, uh, in this case, the child over to the Lord. We'll see some examples of this as, as we move along. Second, we, another word that would come to our mind is that of a vow. It is a promise. It is a, and uh, the, the wording there is very strong. And it, it, it's uh, one direction, but it's a very emphatic word. It's so, uh, we understand the language of that word, the implications when we have a marriage, a wedding, and we exchange the, the, the marriage vows, the wedding vows, making promise and covenant promise to one another. Another word that can easily come to mind would be that of commitment. Because we're saying, well, good, I am going to be committed to my part in this dedication. The obligation that uh, is laid upon us as parents and as a church. And so it's a, it's a commitment to make sure that this child and the parents are nourished and helped and the child is committed to the Lord and we don't want to enter in there and interfere or take any of it back. And our last word would be that of to lend to the Lord. The wording that Hannah used when she uh, committed her child uh, Samuel to Eli when he, she brought him forth in her prayer. She promised that she would lend this child, this man-child, to the Lord for the rest of his life. Tremendous words, and there's the element of sacrifice that is involved in all of this also. I didn't put it on the screen. But once you, once you sacrifice or you give a child over to the Lord, it, it is a giving up and putting on the altar of commitment, of a vow, and of a surrender to the Lord. You're saying, Lord, this child is yours, and with the intent that you wanna see God use him for the furtherance of the gospel, for the building of the kingdom, for the use in the local church or God's uh, economy worldwide. Whatever it is, it's saying, it's all yours. I have my obligation, I have my part in it, but I wanna give it over, give him over to the Lord. So some examples. And I want you to think about the wording that is there, these biblical examples. And one word that I put on there is called sobering. When we take into consideration the occasions recorded for us in scripture, when vows or dedications or commitments were made, the sobering language, the, uh, the non-negotiable contract that is made, there is no turning back, there is no taking back. There is no prenuptial agreement just in case it doesn't work out. There are certain arrangements that you're gonna make, make with God. For example, the, in 1 Samuel chapter 1, we have the, the occasion with Hannah, and her words were this, I will give this child all the days of his life. Now, as parents, we enjoy raising children all the days of their life. We even enjoy when they've left 
home and they come back all the days of their life. And then they bring their grandchildren to your house all the days of their life as much as possible because that is something as parents and grandparents we thoroughly enjoy. But when there is a, in Hannah's case, where we, we don't all live under this kind of a situation in this context, but in Hannah's case, she would have the child long enough for him to be able to walk, take care of himself, and be able to learn from Eli the priest, learn how to be a, a, a prophet, learn how to work in the temple. And so this was a, she had the formative years, the Lord had him for the rest of his life. He would be God's utility. He would be God's tool, God's way of reaching Israel. We take into consideration David and Jonathan. It would be Jonathan who would relinquish and surrender the honor and the glory that would be his as a son of the king. And so we read in that text of scripture in 1 Samuel that he made a covenant with David and gave him his robe. So the, the uh, presidential robe, the, uh, the robe of the king and the son, the prince, he was the prince. And he gave that over to David because they had this covenant bond between them that they would always be friends and honor the Lord for the rest of their life. One would not give up to the other. There are two tragedies in scripture whereby the life of a child, of a parent, was uh, at risk and at stake. One died and the other was rescued. The first one is that of Jephthah. We read about this in the book of Judges where Jephthah made a, a vow to the Lord that if he were able to win this battle, the first person, the first thing that came out of the tent, he would offer that sacrifice to the Lord. That would become the, the uh, sacrifice on the altar. It's hard for us to digest how this could actually take place. And it is not my intent to try and unravel that or make us understand it. The intent of this example is to show us the strength and the meaning of behind the seriousness behind such words as a vow, a commitment, a dedication. We, we try to lighten it a little bit and, and explain, uh, well, you know, maybe I wasn't thinking right or I didn't understand all that it was taking place. These two situations, both of these individuals, Jephthah's daughter eventually would suffer the consequence of his vow. But the point is, he honored it, and she knew that it had to be honored. You read the account yourself. She asked for time to purify herself because she knew that the obligation, the vow, the commitment was real, and it could not be undone because it was something that was spoken to the Lord. A dedication, when we make a dedication of a building ourselves, a child dedication to the Lord, he is the sole witness. He is the one that we commit to. We've made that vow or that promise to him. The other one that is listed for us is Saul and Jonathan. And there was a situation where Saul wasn't quite right as a king to begin with. And so he makes one of those uh, words out of haste. And uh, he just made a vow to all the men. And he, and, he, and he would make everybody be bound to that promise that un until they uh, won a battle, or until something happened from the Lord, no man was allowed to have food or water or touch any of the honey of the land. And Jonathan was not there when those words were said. So the event unfolds and everything takes place. Jonathan comes back to the camp and Saul finds him. And the closing words of that little story are these. Jonathan speaks, I did but taste a little honey with the end of my rod and that was in my hand, and lo, I must die. And Saul answered and said, God do so, and more also, for thou shalt surely die, Jonathan. Now, the rest of the army said, that's not gonna happen. And they actually came in and rescued him. And they would undo what Saul intended to do, and he, whether it was out of his pride, or his anger, or his commitment, because he made such a promise, We'll probably never really know. But one thing we do know is this. Jonathan understood the implications, the seriousness of his dad's words. And he was going to hold his dad to those words. That that individual that would touch the honey, eat food, would die. It gives us the sobering reality 
which leads us then to what the text of Scripture teaches us in Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verses uh, 2 to 5. Keep thy foot when thou goest to the house of God, and be more ready to hear than to give the sacrifice of fools, for they consider not that they do evil. Be not rash with thy mouth, and let not thine heart be hasty to utter anything before God. God is in heaven, you are upon the earth, therefore let your words be few. Better it is that you should not vow than that thou should vow and not pay. Be not rash with our words. In the case of Jephthah, in the case of Saul, these were rash statements. In the case of Hannah and in the, uh, the other uh, story that I gave you, they were not rash. They were pre-planned and they were intentional. They understood what they were saying. But what we read out of Ecclesiastes, Solomon tells us this. If you're going to do a vow, that's good. That's fine. But don't come back later on and say, the angels made me do it or coming up with some lame excuse. God will not listen to those kind of excuses. The sobering seriousness of a dedication of any sort, especially when it comes to that of being a, an infant, a child set apart for the Lord. So let's take a look at this. The essence of any dedication, whether it be for a building, for our private life, a personal life, our house or yourself, is that when we make that statement to dedicate to the Lord, we are making a promise to fulfill all aspects of the dedication, whatever it might be, all the aspects. And we saw even in two situations, there was a tragedy. One was a genuine tragedy with death. The other was a tragedy that and would not come to take place because of the rescue. But the, all that to say this, there are elements, there are aspects of dedication that are there that we have to recognize and satisfy all of things. Why? Because God is in heaven and we are on earth. We talk about baby dedication. Now it's like, finally, we're going to get to the book of Exodus. Well, I had to give the background. It's very important that we understand because now we can better understand why a mother would take her child, put it in the Nile River, uh, uh, which to the Egyptians, to put a baby into the Nile River was a sacrifice to the, the gods of the river. It was also, it was the edict of Pharaoh that all the male children that were to be born were, were to be placed. In there. So why would any mother do that? What is, what is her thinking? Well, we learned several things from this. Our outline, the dedication of the parents, the education of the child, and the preparation of God uh, for the child. So we have parents, we have the education, and we have the sovereignty of God. These three components are in every form of dedication, dedication, no matter who it is or what it is. You cannot make a dedication to, of anything toward the Lord if we ourselves as individuals are not first fully committed and dedicated our lives, our bodies, as living sacrifice, Romans chapter 12, verses one and two, to the Lord. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present yourself a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto the Lord, which is your reasonable service. So that is, that is the definition of what we talk about with dedication. And then we'll eventually look at the education and the, and the providence of God. But how do we get that? Well, let's take a look at what we see here. The dedication of the parents. In the Exodus chapter 2 passage, and the woman conceived, and we find that she bore a son, and when she saw that he was a goodly child, she hid him for three months. And when she could no longer hide him, she took him for him an ark of bulrushes, daubed it with slime and pitch, and put the child therein, and she laid it in the flags of the river's brink. So this is where we come up with this kind, this idea of dedication. We look at the, uh, the uh, Hebrews passage. It was by faith that she would do this. So when we read Hebrews chapter 23, by faith Moses, and there's this, and then he's got a little insert in there, when he was born. So it, you kind of stumble over that. So by faith Moses, when he was born, did Moses have faith at his birth? That's not what the text is teaching us. But rather we could say this, let's eliminate that, that uh, little phrase, there's a technical term for that. By faith Moses' parents hid him three months because they saw he was a proper child. So in dedication, there is that aspect of faith. In Acts chapter 7 and verse 20, when Moses was born and was exceeding fair and was nourished up in his father's house for three months. I want you to make three observations from the Exodus text and, the, and that out of Acts. Number one, 
we read that uh, there are three characteristics of what it is to uh, express dedication. Faith, hope, and a vision. So we look at Moses' parents. And by the way, Exodus tells us that it was his mother. When we get to uh, Acts and Hebrews, the father is included in the uh, dedication, in the rescue, in the commitment of the child to the Lord. Faith by Moses, by faith Moses, when he was hid three months by his parents, they demonstrated their, their knowledge, their understanding that God was going to rescue, that God would protect, that God would save. They were already against the authorities. The word was out, the edict was out by Pharaoh to reduce the population of the Hebrews in Egypt. They were starting to overtake. There was a Pharaoh that came in that did not know Joseph. And he's beginning to understand, and his, to his cabinet, he says, if these Hebrew children continue to multiply the way they do, they are going to overtake us. And so, what is that? But to, to, to euthanize all the infants that were born, the males only, and that would help to level out or to reduce the population. But what about the word hope? We find the word hope is wrapped up in that one phrase, and at this time, Moses was born and was well-pleasing to God. When you go to Acts chapter 7 and verse 20, you will find the language of he was a goodly child, he was well-pleasing. Uh, the, the original word there in the Greek simply means something. It, it actually has the idea that somebody or uh, someone that came out of a city uh, compared to being in the country was an individual of elegance that was worth looking at and, and attractive. So that part of uh, Moses' facial expression certainly did exist. But in the, uh, the uh, Greek language, in the Greek words there, we, you would actually find if you were to go to Greek and do it in interlinear, you would read these words, and was well-pleasing, that is the uh, goodly, and then there is the phrase to Theo, to God. That tells us something that God is using the beauty of the child's face to get the attention of the parents. But at the same time, there is, I believe, somewhat of a mystery that is taking place here. And that is, the parents of Moses would see in this child not just that physical aspect of his beauty, but there was something there speaking in their heart that they could see beyond the lovely child that he was to be something for God, but they did not know what. I would propose to you, but because of the oral tradition of teaching that was brought in by Isaac and Jacob, and then would end with the life of Joseph, and the fact that his bones would be delivered out of Egypt back into the promised land, that, that all of those words and those stories would elevate and keep alive the hope of the Hebrews, that there would be a day when God would deliver them from the bondage that they were in. And then when you read the entire story, you begin to see the, the fruition of that to take place. And it takes place mainly in the life of Moses. How much of the detail of that, we do not know. But that phrase, the goodly child, a beautiful child, shows up in Exodus, shows up in Hebrews, and it's used again by Stephen in the books of Acts. And every time it speaks of the man and how later on he would become that leader for the people of that nation. And then there's that vision. And I, I think when we talk about the characteristic of dedication, you have faith, hope, and a vision. Faith believes that God is, is going to manage the affairs of that child fully, completely, and accurately, the hope that he anticipates, parents anticipate what God is going to do, that God is a God that, that needs servants, he is going to use them, and has the vision that it acts on things not yet seen. Therefore, in, in uh, Hebrews chapter 11, uh, we, in verse 6, we read about by faith Noah, being warned of God of things that were not yet so being warned of God is something that did not take place, yet God saw, said it would. Noah essentially saying, here is a vision that there's something, in this case, something uh, drastic, catastrophic that is going to happen. But Noah acted on those words not yet seen. Moses' parents did not see Moses as a uh, legislator 
as, the, as one that would deliver, as one that would be the leader, they saw that God had a purpose in his life, faith, hope, and vision. Let's look at the education of the child. The education of the child, when we look at the Exodus passage, and uh, as God providentially uses people like his sister Miriam, and, and then the princess of Egypt, and then her maids. And as she, as the princess of Egypt, the, the daughter of Pharaoh, lifts that child out of the water, and the child is, is weeping, she then, out of compassion, says, uh, and listening to Miriam, who was sent there, all of this by the providence of God, do you need a mother to nurse the child? Takes the child back to her own mother, and, and we're told in Acts chapter 7, she had him for three months. So, the, uh, three additional months. In, 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 uh, in the child's life. Now we don't know what his age was by the time that, the, that uh, Moses' mother would take him and give it to Pharaoh's daughter. But we do know this, uh, that she had ample time, enough. So I'm, I'm going to venture out uh, that the child was old enough to understand words and the, the promises of God that there would be a deliverer, the word of God as it pertained, remember there was no law, there were no Ten Commandments, but all those things that lend themselves to righteousness and honoring the Lord. Because as we would read on in other passages later on, we find in Hebrews chapter 11, in verse 24, by faith Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. You don't do that unless you were educated in a biblical worldview, to use our parlance for the day. You don't refuse to become the, son, the, the child of Pharaoh's daughter. And as we read further on in the text of Hebrews, he, had, he was well informed. He was taught in the, the wisdom and in the ways of the Egyptians. He had a promising future, but he rejected that. But he did that by faith. But why would he reject that? Because the parents had the opportunity for his education. Now, it very well could be that during that time, even though he is uh, the child of Pharaoh's daughter, he may have went back to the Nile, met with his mother, and you could be sure that, that he was being taught uh, there were enough Hebrews in there that as Moses would migrate around as he's growing up, it wasn't until age 40 that he acts out of his own will, but acts upon what he believed to be, that he was going to be the next leader. We're told that in, in the scriptures. But nevertheless, the training, the instruction, the bringing them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord was the education and that's part of what baby dedication is. That's part of what, when we talk about dedicating our own lives to the Lord, we also mean that we are taking and making every effort to educate ourselves, to inform ourselves, to disciple ourselves, or be with somebody to do that so that we can be useful in the hands of God for his work. The preparation by God of the child found in, in the Exodus chapter, in the Exodus passage. And, and so with the dedication and then the preparation, now we find we get to the preparation by God. And when he had opened it, he saw the child. Behold, the babe wept, and she had compassion on him and said, This is one of the Hebrews' children. Then said his sister unto Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call thee a nurse of the Hebrew women, that she may nurse the child for thee? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. And the maid went and called the child's mother. Now, from where they were at, from their perspective, everybody just happened to be there. Miriam was probably dispatched. I believe that Miriam absolutely wanted to see what was going to go down. But when Pharaoh's daughter and then the maids, and of all of the, 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 the flags that are sticking up out of the Nile River at the right time, when she was coming to, to do this daily bathing, there she sees that child, the child cries at the right time, the compassion of her heart. You know, here's an interesting study. I don't know how much you'll get out of it, but we have to give credit to Pharaoh's daughter. She also violated the king's edict. That's, you got to take that into consideration. It was her dad that said, 
all the male children are to be uh, executed in the, in the river. And yet, God used her sense of compassion to be able to rescue that child. And then God would use her to raise the question or listen to the question by Miriam, shall I get a Hebrew nurse to nurse the child? And the maids that would then go and find the mother of Moses, not knowing that's who it was. So what about all of that? Well, it's a, it's a process of preparation. God uses circumstances and people and to prepare his servants and they may not always make sense to us. I don't know what Moses' mother was thinking when she put it in there. It may, there may have been that element. I don't know what else to do. This doesn't really make sense. But I believe, and by faith, Moses' parents put him in the river. So pointless and senseless, senseless yes, but by faith. And sometimes faith acts upon things and does things that do not make sense. And God will use those kind of circumstances that have no rhyme or reason, but yet it's all process of preparation. Even today, God can use the, the congregation. He can use Christian education, Sunday school classes, parents, other people to be involved in preparing. And, and, and uh, the multitude, the multiplicity of, of individuals that were involved in this one moment at a riverbank that would bring up a child, a man, dedicated to the Lord by the parents, who would then become the, the deliverer, the leader, the one that would bring Israel out of Egypt and, and start the entire redemptive story and bring us the law and the rest of it you read in the Old Testament. All of that because God uses a multitude of ways and, and people. So we, when we talk about all of this, we bring it all together. We have to take into consideration with a conclusion that there are some basic understanding that we have when it comes to child baby dedication. Now, I just want to review these very quickly, and it, it would go like this. Number one, God has rewarded Mark and Jen with this precious child. And at the same time, God has entrusted to you the preparation of the child for his purposes. So you receive a reward. Children are a heritage of the Lord. They uh, are given as precious gifts from God. And then there is the entrustment. Every child given to parents, God is saying, I'm leaving them, you are their managers. I entrust their care, their spiritual growth, their development, their understanding of the difference between right and wrong. What does the scripture say? That is something that is entrusted or committed to your care. Number three, it requires a heart of love and devotion to God and to the, the brethren of the church. So this is not a, a separate thing. This is something that you guys are going to do it independently of the rest of the congregation. And the charge of the congregation is that we participate in this. Being at this very sermon here this morning uh, and then knowing the, the obligation and the duty and also there will be days when it's going to be very, very difficult as they grow up. You don't have to wait till they're teenagers. They're going to start giving you a hard time two, three, four, five, and six because each child is born with their own individual will and that will has to be conformed to the will of God and as a process. And a lot of times it takes more work. Some children are like, or like, you know, you walked into the land of milk and honey right to begin with. Some you think you're still in Egypt. But either way, it is something that requires additional effort. This, this also, it, we make this statement, I am decisively surrendering my ownership of this child to God in exchange for the honorable privilege of leading him to Christ and preparing his heart to know and understand God's will for his life, this honorable privilege. And then the last one, I will look to this church. So you have the wealth of experience and wisdom. Some of the experience, like, I don't know where I'd ever find that in the scripture, and you may not find it in the scripture, but there's experience from people that have raised children, that have grandchildren, there is the wisdom of the scriptures, and all of that 
merges together. Wisdom requires what to listen to and what to depend upon. But to look to the church is one of the spiritual obligations that we have as parents when we dedicate our children to the Lord. So I'd like for um, Mark and Jen to come forward. James gave up on me. I was afraid that was going to happen. And we want to give a charge now to the congregation and to Mark and Jen at this time. I'm going to, we're going to try and see if it works, but I'll take a handheld with me. Sometimes baby dedications can be like weddings. Mm -hmm. We've been there. We've seen that. We understand. But in the meanwhile, I'd like for us to just entertain for a couple of moments to be thinking in practical ways in which uh, we can be useful and helpful as a, as a congregation. We look in the scripture, and the first thing you just want to do is uh, type in the words, one another. Because in the Bible, there are numerous, pray for one another, serve one another, honor one another, bear one another's burdens, encouraging one another. So the, the scriptures teach us that we are meant for each other. We are a people of relationship. And Mark and Jen, come on up here. We'll just continue moving. And in this relationship that we have, we are all part of the bringing up and the nourishing of our children. Let's give you one brief example. Uh, we, we remember one of the uh, men in my life was Otis Richardson, former member of the church, now at home to be with the Lord. But he would take young teenagers and he would use them. He'd put them to work, maybe helping out with some construction work, some, some cleanup. And uh, Otis had a little expression, give me one teenager, I can keep him working. Give me two, I can get a lot done. Give me three, and we're not going to go anywhere. <laughs> it, he, he understood the dynamics of young people and always wanting to talk. But he would teach them life lessons, work ethic. And that's just one example. You don't want to have to own a business to be able to do this. But whenever you have any one of our children, in this case, James, in your care, you don't always have to sit down with him and open up your Bible and something like that. But by your example, and as time goes by, you may be finding yourself in a situation where they raise questions, and as another parent, to be able to help answer those questions, or even a conversation with mom and dad. All of that is a part of the way that we can be helpful and useful. So I want to read to us uh, the, the, this, these words on dedication. This is the part of the ceremony where we listen to the words very carefully. Throughout the ages, godly parents have presented their children to the Lord in dedication. You follow a noble heritage. In presenting your child to the Lord, you enter into a solemn relationship with God who keeps his covenant to a thousand generations and this congregation. While dedication is a worthy act, you must understand that it offers no saving virtue. Dedication does not guarantee your child's salvation. For this requires a personal commitment that each one must make on his own upon reaching the age of awareness of his sin and accountability and the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Salvation is obtained by grace through faith in Jesus Christ as a personal savior upon repentance. Though the dedication ceremony does not save, 
It nonetheless, a most significant act of faith and declaration of intent by the parents to provide Christian nurture to their child. Let's just briefly go over this. It simply means that James has not a clue what's going on, but you do. James, if it were not in this environment in your life, at this church, may grow up and never hear the gospel. But he now has parents that know the Lord, that love the Lord, and you understand. And so you have a declaration of intent to honor God's word and to uh, have a part in changing his life, giving him that precious knowledge of what it is to be saved. So our covenant of commitment. We, I, I said enough on vows here this morning. And when we talk about a covenant commitment, sometimes it's just reduced to words. But let's take these words with the full weight of their meaning. Believing that this child is a gift from God and that he shall hold you accountable for him. Do you now solemnly confess that it is your purpose to dedicate this child to the Lord and to his service? It's kind of like at a wedding, you see. We will. We do. We do. You want to say that twice? Like our wedding? <laughs> okay. Will you pray with him and for him, instruct him faithfully in the doctrines of the Christian faith, teach him to read the word of God, and to pray and to lead a holy life? Yes, sir. Amen. Will you take him faithfully to the house of worship to attend its services? And I'm going to add this part to its VBS and to its Sunday school. <laughs> And to the youth meetings as he grows in. All right. <laughs> I inject that little bit of humor, but um, it's, that's part of our services. It is part of, our, of what we do in teaching. And to do all that is in your power to bring him to the knowledge of Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. Amen. So in the presence of God and in these witnesses... We have Mark and Jen Magara, as they've made that covenant promise, that vow, that commitment, that it's, they're surrendering their child to the Lord, but they're making the statement of intent to nurture, to teach, to raise, to discipline, to encourage. And so in the presence of God and all these witnesses, you here today have formally said to us, this is our promise to James and to the Lord. And as a congregation, will we endeavor faithfully, whenever way or means or opportunities that we have, to likewise share in the promise and the commitment and the intent to nurture James, to lead him to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, to instruct him in the ways of righteousness, encourage him to be part of those things that I mentioned, VBS, Bible school, studies, and youth group as he continues to grow. Christian education is also a vital part. As a congregation, can we answer with a hearty amen that yes, we will. Amen. amen. Praise the Lord. Let's close in a word of prayer. Father, we do thank you. We thank you for this, uh, one, these wonderful parents that you've laid it upon their hearts to express their commitment, their dedication to you, and to commit James into your care. But in the meanwhile, during these formative years, to teach him and make him ready to be one of your choice servants. We know that any one of us can be used of God in many, many different ways. It may be in the public sector. It might be that, Lord, in that of a church and a congregation. Perhaps something on a state, a national. We do not know. But we do know that the opportunities are there. But what is most important that we promise to do what we know and with what we have to prepare and to teach. So we commit James to you. He is yours, lent to the Lord. We commit uh, Mark and Jen to you, Lord, that you would find them faithful and that you would, by your grace, help them in this journey as they would nurture and bring their own child up in the education of the things of God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God bless you and congratulations. We much, much are blessed by this occasion. All right.